What's the elevator version of when you tell people the history of this project? Can you kind of tell us when it started? Go through the whole thing. Please keep your limbs inside the train at all times. Do not attempt to open the doors until the train is complete. The original kickoff date was 2004. It actually started as two projects. They sort of realized they were doing the same thing, so they joined forces. And I think the original intent was to just upgrade some textures, upgrade some models, and then make uh, Half-Life 1 be a little bit shinier. And then once the projects merged, they realized that they had like an even larger goal of sort of re-envisioning Half-Life. So that probably takes us up to like 2006 when I started on the mod. All volunteer, everybody was just uh, doing it because they really loved Half-Life. It sort of evolved from there. We did Steam Greenlight. Valve actually approached us about going retail with the product. And then in 2015, we went out, we released on Steam. And then after Steam Greenlight and after they approached us about going retail, we had to form a company. Uh, and we ended up on uh, Crowbar Collective. It's like 50 to 100 people of varying contribution levels. Even if one guy comes in and does a fantastic model and then leaves, that was awesome for us. But once we were a little more serious in going retail, it was like 25 people probably that, that were working consistently on the mod. Almost all of us had full-time jobs, or at the very least part-time jobs. Some people are architects, some people are nurses, like they, they like Half-Life, and that motivated them to learn these tools. 25 people for the scope of this game really isn't that big to begin with. Thanks a lot, Black Mesa. The story of Black Mesa isn't a short one. It takes place over the course of two decades. It concerns the contributions of hundreds of people. It was once the story of a fan-made mod, then a commercial remaster, and eventually an ambitious remake. Black Mesa Source began in 2004 as a mod to remake the original Half-Life in the Source engine that was used to create Half-Life 2. Years into development, it was given Valve's blessing and turned into a standalone commercial project. After over a decade of work from hundreds of contributors, it was released on Early Access in 2015. This version contained all the Earthbound levels from the original game, but was crucially missing the game's final chapter on the border world, Zen. These levels, generally regarded as the weakest part of Half-Life 1 and a blot on an otherwise perfect game, would lay the stage for the team's greatest challenge. Using all they had learned from recreating Half-Life, they would attempt to redesign Zen for the modern first-person player, while also trying to bridge the narrative of Half-Life 1 with its groundbreaking sequel. So this is the guy, huh? Thought you'd never make it. The development of Black Mesa went on for so long that it began at the height of Half-Life 2's popularity, continued past the episodes, and throughout a 13-year gap in which the series lay dormant. While Half-Life was dead, while people like me were making documentaries about how the series was gone forever, the team working on Black Mesa were keeping the flame burning. Past the development and release of dozens of other Source games, they continued touching up the Mona Lisa, modernizing a game from a previous century. The development of Black Mesa is impossible to sum up in a single documentary, even one that's over two hours long. So what exactly is the story we're going to tell today? Well, consider this. Many of the people who shipped Black Mesa have worked on a commercial Half-Life game longer than anyone else in the world. And yes, that includes the people at Valve. After the release of Half-Life 2, Valve published a book consisting of everything they learned during the course of that game's development. And since then, Raising the Bar has become a sort of a bible of sorts for people who want to make games like Half-Life. So it was interesting that when we approached Crowbar Collective and asked them about doing a documentary on Black Mesa, it was actually this book that they pointed to. This documentary is their Raising the Bar, a dissertation on everything they have learned about making Half-Life games, something they refer to as the Valvian game design philosophy. A first-person art form that, despite creating some of the most beloved games ever made, is as rare as it's ever been. By dissecting levels in both Black Mesa's Earthbound levels, their full-on remake of Half-Life's troubled final chapter on the Border World Zen, we will explore the philosophy of Valvian game design as they have come to understand it. 
So where do we possibly start this journey? How about something that almost all of us love about Half-Life and Half-Life 2? Story, narrative, world building. Perhaps not the first thing you'd expect would need much of a touch up, but as you're about to find out, touching up an old gem can lead to unforeseen consequences. I first started on the project on, uh, it was May 4th, 2006. That's when I got the, uh, the email that I was brought in after I had kind of submitted a little writing packet uh, to get on the team. I had pitched myself to them as a, a writer and a designer. I was at the Art Institute of Pittsburgh and my friends had all kind of gotten onto the Black Mesa team one by one. They knew that I was also just a huge Half-Life fan and they approached me. They said, you know, we'd love to have you on the team as like a modeler or something. I wanted to do writing and design and I was not finding any outlet for that. So when they came to me and pitched me as a modeler on their team, I, I said, no, you should hire me as a writer or designer. Like that's what the team needs. That's what this project needs. It's just interesting to think about it now because narrative in a video game is now so it's really respected and kind of revered, you know, it's risen a few steps uh, in terms of it. But I think really the team just thought like the game is written. What do we need a writer for? You know what I mean? Like it's already got, we know what happens. We know when it happens. Why would we need a writer? You know, and I could see after playing Half-Life 2 and seeing how their uh, narrative had really matured and their ability to tell a story in that had matured and just kind of, you know, picking up on all the things that they had done in the first game and the second one. I just knew that there was, uh, there was a lot of room for interesting expansion, you know, creative development, things like that, ways that we could combine the Source engine with the, the original Half-Life narrative. I would say that the rules of Valve's storytelling, at least their, their storytelling in Half-Life games, uh, as set up with the first Half-Life, is you want it to be a first-person experience, to be uncut with uh, cutscenes or anything. You know, you're always in control of your character, and then you're also like a silent protagonist, which kind of allows the player to inhabit that character. You know, in like the first-person flow state, people are talking to you, the, the lines around your monitor kind of blur, you know, you're inhabiting Gordon Freeman's body. Make it so that the player is always in control and that the player always has agency, which is such a wild concept when you think about like when it came out, you know? And even when I think about my own development with video games and what I liked about video games when I was a kid, what I was attracted to is I always loved the, the cutscenes, you know, the big cutscenes. That was like the reward for playing the game. You would get to a point where there'd be a big, beautiful, fully rendered CG thing that looked different from the other polygons, and that was like a big deal. And then Half-Life drops in and pulls off this like trick where like suddenly there aren't any cutscenes. And I don't even think that registered to me when I first played the game. You know what I mean? I don't think I was aware that I was constantly in control and flying around and that there was, it never, you know, pulled out for a third person perspective to kind of like give me an overview of the level. I think that kind of like on subsequent playthroughs and reading reviews and you know other people talking about it, that, that really started to make sense and then you kind of notice just how incredible of a feat that is uh, narratively to be able to string the player along, get them to you know experience all these set pieces, these story beats where, where they are in kind of like full control of the character and the camera while they're moving around in there. And it's just amazing to see all the, all the kind of care and like camera tricks, magic tricks, just the things they do to kind of create those like perfect little, you know, uh, cinematic or narrative set pieces that you just like slip right into. It's wild that Valve <laughs> let you commercialize this project. Um, can you tell us a little bit about like what they've been like to work with over the years? Yeah, so they're they're fairly hands off, and I kind of see that as as a good thing. I don't know if they they trust us or or not. I, I assume they do, but uh, way back before we even did Steam Greenlight, they were like, "Hey, do you want to send us a beta?" And at that point, the game was in very rough shape. I think this is like 2010, 2011. We sent them the beta. They're like, "Oh, cool, everything's coming along good." And I sort of theorized that they were like feeling us out if they they wanted to offer us a license. Uh, and at that point, it was a definite no, because the, the game was not ready. We decided uh, to sort of pause on Zen and focus on the Earthbound levels, and that's what the 2012 mod release was, like all the Earthbound levels, and we were really happy with that. I assume uh, between Greenlight and that release, Valve took notice, and that's why they, they reached out to us about um, going retail. If we have a specific question, uh, we can message them, but uh, other than that, they're, uh, they're, they're just doing their thing. 
to me, it felt like the level designers approached a lot of this stuff with, okay, like we are going to be fixing things that don't work. My role, being someone who's like completely infatuated with the original text and you know, like the original script, all that kind of stuff, my personal feeling, and I, this may be you know up for debate amongst the community, but my feeling was that I did not want to get in there and rewrite anything, right? And with the Earthbound stuff, it's. I would never add NPCs to an area where they were not there. Like, I would not add them to an area where they were not before, right? And there are loads of instances in the original Half-Life where you walk into a room and there was a scientist there, and, you know, his fists are balled up, and he's just kind of, like, waiting for you to, like, show up, and, you know, his mouth, like, flaps. And, like, you know, so the, the, like these little, like, story scenes, and it's like, that's a perfect opportunity. I would look for those moments where it's like, here's a scientist in a room devoid of context, you know, or like detail. And those are the things that I'm really gonna grab onto. I want to be able to plug these guys into their environment in a way that uh, just makes the scene feel more realistic, more grounded, really takes advantage of what the Source engine can offer. I've got my little corner and I'm sticking to it. I had so many scenes, so many characters that I need to fill out. These levels would come to me and they'd be fully formed and they'd have NPCs in these rooms. And so that was just kind of how the marching orders came in. It's like, okay, the level designers have all the say, all the control really, and their level would arrive to me and I would just kind of work with the stage I was provided with, you know, and uh, just try to use whatever available assets were there and try to tell stories with the characters, how, how it was already set up. A really good example for me of, of what I would think of a scene that that I think threads the needle really well in taking an existing scene but enhancing it so that it uh, it works better would be in Office Complex. At the very end of Office Complex, there's uh, you meet up with a guard and a scientist, and the guard has just like one line of dialogue where he just says, you know, like, hey, uh, the elevators are out of order, but we can still climb. Elevators are out of order, but we can still climb. And it's, that's it, right? And you just come down here and you grab those guards and the scientists and you go upstairs and like that's the end of the scene. And what I wanted to do with that scene is try to get the guard and the scientists to talk a little more. It's not just one line of dialogue from the guard now. It is the, the scientist kind of talks. He's more scared and hesitant about, oh, but the elevators are out of order, you know? And then the guard's the one who's confidently like, we can still climb, you know, and like clicks the gun. <laughs> and he's like ready to, you know, charge forward. And to me, that's like, that's a scene that like, hopefully still fits in the world and the feeling of Half-Life, still feels authentic to that that world, but then, and then also takes an existing scene and rewrites it, but hopefully doesn't change like the, the voice, the perspective, the, the angle of the scene, like the, the, the objectives of the scene, the stakes of the scene. Just trying to make sure that every scene embodies what the original scene tried to do, and then also in addition, takes advantage of all these great things that the Source Engine can do with uh, the character animations, facial animations, uh, and just all, all the great storytelling tools that were available. Is there any other sort of like generalist uh, rules that, that apply? Yeah, there's a, a ton of them. Um, the big ones for me that stand out uh, in the Half-Life series are no cinematics, and that sort of goes hand in hand with like the, the no tutorials. There's very small portions of the game where control gets taken away from the player. Off the top of my head, only I can only think of apprehension where you get captured by the HECU. So that the, the players are always in control and then also no time jumps other than again when you get knocked out in apprehension. Something that I think really invests the player into the Half-Life games is that you're there throughout the entire experience. So you, in, in Half-Life 1, you're actually the reason for the entire, like, you, you set up the, the whole disaster yourself because you push the crystal into the uh, anomalous materials machine. So that gives you some stakes in it. You, you started this, so maybe you should probably look into solving it. It's not shutting down! We sort of look at it as Valve has a, a three-step process for mechanics, where they introduce the mechanic in a simple way, and then they teach you the mechanic, uh, and then they test you on the mechanic, so that you have this evolution and you're learning how to use these things without ever having a tutorial. Uh, it's tutorialized, but you know there's not text on the screen that says, "Hey, you can do this," and then it gives you this, and so on. We tried to embrace that and understand that, and it was a learning process. 
I mean, we're still learning about it. I don't, I don't think anybody in the game industry who's, who's good at what they do ever stops learning. But it, it was it was quite the process for us to fully understand it um, going into the Zen levels and, and revitalizing the Earthbound levels. Like the, the red valves that you see in Unforeseen Consequences, what we realized is we weren't properly introducing the red valves to the player. So we have one that's in the wall, and you go up to it, and you do get a little text prompt that says press E to use. And then you can turn, I believe it's the refrigerator off so that you can lower the temperature of it. And then the second one, you see pretty much the same setup, but there's no valve. And immediately to the right, uh, there's a red valve on the floor. So it teaches the player, pick up this valve, put it into the slot, and then you can turn off the freezer to progress. We introduce it simply. We give them a really limited not even a test yet of, of using the red valve. Uh, and then I think again in the sewer area, we, we have a, a valve that's further away. So then now we're, we're making sure that the player understands the red valve mechanic. And then we keep bringing red valves back throughout uh, the entirety of Earthbound. We noticed that one of the things that we'd done, and as I said, I think this was half things that we hadn't thought about previously and then changed from the original, or half things that the original hadn't done itself, was that players could solve puzzles without knowing they'd solved the puzzles, which doesn't make any sense because it's not a puzzle if you don't understand that you're trying to solve a problem. It's just doing things. And I think Half-Life 1 actually got away with it a bit more because they're very basic environments. They're very simple and stripped back. So you can kind of get away with that a bit more because you don't, things don't, details don't get lost as easily. Whereas in our version of the game, it's very detailed dense. There's stuff everywhere. We try to ascribe purpose to sections throughout. It's much easier to lose where you are and what you're doing and where the exits are and all those kinds of things. So I think that it was actually something the original didn't do in a lot of places as well, but it got away with it because it was a lot simpler. We also made areas a lot bigger in, in Black Mesa in general, so that compounds the problem because you can get lost easier in bigger spaces. So as I mentioned when we were talking about my role on the team and things earlier, one of the things that I've done historically a lot of is going in and reworking map sections to, to make them fit together better. And sort of what happened as we developed Zen was our design chops improved substantially as we really forced ourselves to try and get into a more Valvian mindset and a more sort of just a, a good design mindset really. And we learned from some of the mistakes that we've made in Zen. When we were coming to the 1.0 early access release of the game, we took a look back at the things that we'd built from the original Half-Life and we noticed a lot of flaws in it because we didn't have that design mindset at the time. You know, we were less of a professional team at the time. It was a lot more disparate and less cohesive, so there were lots of kind of one-off bits, as I mentioned, the kinds of things that we don't really like anymore. There were lots of sections of map where you would solve a puzzle without actually seeing what the problem was first, and also not actually seeing that you'd solved the puzzle. So the residue processing vat is is probably the best example of that. The, the, the way that the, the Black Mesa version had originally been designed was, you come out into the main room, there's this ladder that leads up to the top of a vat and then uh, a pipe that leads up to a vent. And the pipe that leads into a vent has a fire in front of it. You then leave the room and you go into an adjacent room and you turn a valve. And that valve turns off the fire that allows you to go into the vent. However, the way the player enters the room in the old version, most players don't actually see the fire or the vent. And when you go and turn the valve, you don't see anything happen. So what happens is, you kind of just enter the room, leave it, turn a valve off somewhere, and then you go, well, what did I just do? When we were reviewing the Earthbound sections for the 1.0 release, I kind of identified a lot of the parts where I thought, we need to do something about this because the player, we're not doing enough to teach the player what they're supposed to be doing here. And I think some of these things were present in Half-Life 1 as well, but some of them were from our own reimaginings of sections or our own recreations. So I think it was a mixture of things the original didn't do very well and things that we didn't do very well. The first thing I did was, as I mentioned earlier when I was talking about framing, I reframed that room. So as you enter the room, the vat is off to your far right. And so that's one of the reasons why the player didn't see the obstacle originally. So I, I moved the pipe into a corner of the room and then angled it at 45 degrees so that the player is directly facing the vat as they enter the room. I then moved the fires down to the ladder next to the vat rather than the vent that exits because a fire covering a ladder is a much clearer sign than of fire covering an obstacle later past the ladder. Because luckily the map had already been designed in this way, I just added a window next to the valve where you turn the fire off. I kind of had to do a bunch of moving things around to make that actually work and make sense. And I think I had to re reorganize the pipe and stuff. But 
basically I just added a window that means when you turn the valve, you see the fire go out next to the ladder in front of you as you're turning the valve. And then I also kind of, we, we worked in a bit of visual language where the pipe is red. And so that kind of helps you tie it into what you're doing because the, the valve you turn is red and it's kind of all linked together. So just a few very simple things completely solved a problem in a section where in other playthroughs, we noticed loads of players were going and turning the valve, wandering off and then getting frustrated. And there were loads of little bits like that throughout residue processing that contributed to players really hating that chapter because they felt that they were spending a lot of time wandering around not understanding what they were doing and not being able to solve it. And there were just lots of parts throughout our Earth sections that kind of violated these rules. And they were kinds of ones that we'd learned to adhere to throughout Zen. So we went back and we just reworked them so that we adhered to them. It was very confusing. Residue processing in general, we did a lot of work on and it was a perfect example of um, not showing uh, cause and effect because you'd go into this isolated room, turn a valve, and it would turn off a fire back to where you had first entered. And people don't logically think to backtrack to progress. So a huge mantra for us was cause and effect. So if you interact with something, you you have to see what it does. Um, and that was a huge part of our iteration process of like, I push this button and I have no idea what I just did. In, in Office Complex, you, you navigate around a series of shelves and vents, and you have to come and find a valve to plug into something and you move this slab of meat to form a bridge between two vents and then you use that bridge between the two vents to exit. The problem is the way the previous version of the room was structured and I believe this was true in Half-Life 1 as well is that you just you can just go and find the valve plug it in and turn it and then you move the meat and then you think what does this accomplish so you're kind of just trial and erroring your way through it and then you, w you will eventually solve the puzzle just by virtue of moving the thing around traversing the area and finding that you've now bridged the gap between the two vents but i really again this really kind of went against a lot of what we thought needed to be done to see the design i, I closed a bunch of doors i rerouted a bunch of sections and closed them off from each other so that now you go through that section you come up to the vent and you see the other vent in front of you and then you drop down into the section with the valve so when the players do move the meat if they see it's moving towards those vents they're more likely to go right i'm bridging that gap so I originally started out as a fan of Black Mesa. Um, I was a super fan after it released as a mod in 2012. And um, when the game released, when, when the mod released, sorry, I'm, I'm so used to calling it a game now. When the mod was released in 2012, there were two chapters that were significantly cut from their original Half-Life 1 versions. So that was Surface Tension and On a Rail. And I sort of dabbled in source level design at that point. And I thought for fun, why don't I try and recreate those missing sections just as a bit of a challenge because I'd never done single player level design before. So I started working on that and I kind of, I fed it into the community and they really liked it. And so when I finished the On A Rail Uncut mod in 2013, the Black Mesa team approached me and said, would I like to join the team and work with them on multiplayer? And I said, yes, please. <laughs> so I um, I joined the team and then that was when they told me that the, uh, the game was going to be sold as a retail product on Steam after the game had been greenlit. And then beyond that point, we started updating the game on early access multiple times. We actually released Surface Tension Uncut as a full official update to the game, which we rebuilt from scratch based on my old mod version. And then as we kind of got really into the thick of Zen development, that was when I became the level design lead and sort of tried to help march it over the finish line across the heavy part of Zen development. On a Rail got cut specifically because basically the original chapter was extremely ambling, very, very long and very unpopular. Apart from Zen, I would say it was probably the most unpopular part of Half-Life 1. So the, the mod team at the time decided we're going to do a completely different interpretation of On a Rail. We're just going to shorten it dramatically and kind of do our own thing with it. And that's what they did. That was kind of intentionally cut. Whereas Surface Tension, the specific reason the team had cut that was because the level designer that was working on those maps left very suddenly towards the release and they decided that it was too much work to continue to finish the levels, so they just cut those out of the game and did a quick band-aid fix for the mod release. The reason why we eventually ended up adding Surface Tension uncut officially, but not on a rail, was because the decision to cut Surface Tension wasn't done intentionally, whereas the cuts to on a rail were intentional. So the Black Mesa version of on a rail is actually mostly sort of, I would say, original design. It's not really got a lot of the Half-Life 1 DNA in it, apart from a couple of sections, because the Half-Life 1 design was very sprawling, very um, exploratory, very looping, and players would get quite confused. In the current retail version of Black Mesa, Honor Real is pretty much as it was in the mod, with a couple of changes that we made for the definitive edition that we released recently. 
and then surface tension has uh, my updates and the surface tension stuff that was cut specifically uh, from the original it was i think two maps towards the end of the chapter which featured very heavily a lot of combat specifically between the soldiers and the aliens and i remember as a fan when i played it i noted the absence of these maps not because the maps were actually any good in the original in fact i would say they're some of the weakest maps in half-life one but the kind of story element of the soldiers dramatically losing to the aliens at this point in the story, I really felt it was missing from the mod. And we just kind of, we really went home trying to trying to make it make just a more cinematic interpretation of, of the maps, which we felt were quite weak in the original. Building the Earthbound levels, I think, was perfect for where we were at at the time, because most of us were in college or just recently out of college. Some of us had just recently graduated high school. Uh, so having that template was probably about all we could handle uh, with our understanding of game design and game mechanics. It was great to be able to have the, the blueprint and then just sort of make it pretty. Looking at the Earthbound levels, that's what we needed. We needed that blueprint um, because of just where we were at in our uh, our growth. And then we decided at the end to, to do what we called at the time the fun quest, um, where we wanted to inject a bit more of um, like Valvian philosophy of how Valve would build the game if they built it in 2012. So that's where the flares came from, where you, you pick up the flares and throw them at the zombies and light them on fire. Um, we set up gas traps so that you could throw flares into the gas traps and, and catch the zombies on fire. Something that is a little more interactive. We also really wanted to focus in on being able to use allies. So that's why in Unforeseen Consequences you, can, you don't have a gun right away or a crowbar uh, and you have to ask the, the guard for help and then he follows you around. So there was a lot of stuff like that that we sort of injected last minute to maybe make it feel a, a bit more like a modern game and a, a bit more engaging. Some of it doesn't work as well as I would like it to, but I, I think the the overall spirit of that sort, like, sort of set us off on the path for what would become Zen and what would become our later revisions on the Earthbound levels. The final scene in Lambda Core is the supply depot scene. You've been told to get to Lambda Core the entire game. That's what a scientist, you know how to put an end to this, uh, the, the resonance cascade, the disaster, that, that's where they're located. It's been the thrust of the whole game up to this point, is get to the Lambda Core. And so you finally show up there and you meet this group of uh, scientists and guards, kind of like the ragtag bunch, you know, the, the final survivors here. And they usher you into the supply depot and explain to you this is where we have been breaching the membrane between Zen and Earth, and we've been going back and forth a lot more than you've been led to believe. You know, you might have gotten your ideas and uh, questionable ethics that there's more to this than meets the eye. And this is where the, uh, the survey team was going and collecting samples before they started being collected themselves. You know, all those like classic lines of dialogue. It's the, the final staging area for Gordon Freeman on Earth, you know, when he's uh, gearing up. It's like the, the gear up montage in an action movie, you know, where he like goes and suits up before he jumps into the portal to defeat the last boss. Don't worry, we're not done with the Earthbound levels quite yet, but much like the portals themselves, we're going to be doing a lot of jumping back and forth here. For the levels set on Earth, the team had a fairly good template to work from, but in Zen they were pushing well beyond the source material, creating a version of Zen that respected the levels as much as people remembered them and the original intent of the Half-Life 1 design doc. They'd need to do all this while also reflecting the modernized Valvian design from Half-Life 2 and providing a more natural connection to the narrative of the sequel. All right, make sure your long jump module is tightly fastened. We've a lot of ground to cover. I think reasonable people can come down on both sides of if you like Zen or if you don't. I, it's somewhat subjective, but I, I do agree. I think a lot of it's at the very least polarizing. We knew we had to do or we wanted to do something with Zen. 
whether it's like uh, just a smooth transition or a, um, a, a beautification, we knew we wanted to do something. Chris Horn was working on these really detailed plans to, to sort of overhaul it and make it into our own thing. There was a, a brief moment where I did like a quick design break of like, here's how we could overhaul the Zen levels and sort of keep uh, in mind what's there in, in the original. Like for example, the butterflies, uh, you release them from their cages and that helps you uh, advance in the puzzle, which is, it's abstract and it's crazy, but it's definitely like OG Half-Life. Eventually, Chris finished the plans. We all really liked them. And Mark Foreman, first he did some pre art, which we sort of saw, like if you squint, you could see it was very good art, but it was just a little bit different than the style we have now. Uh, and then he sort of delivered these um, modular kits that we could like strewn about the first couple of Zen levels. And that's where things really started clicking and we really started to understand what we wanted to do with the Zen levels. We'd gotten to the point where we realized that we couldn't create Zen and Earthbound and get the game out within a reasonable time frame. And my position on this, pushing for the game to be split, was that if we were to split Zen, we could then focus entirely on it and possibly go for something a bit grander, uh, bigger, maybe even rather than just adding the game on, make it a separate game in itself and call it Black Mesa Zen. In 2012, I sat down with Carlos and a couple of other people to talk about creating a full level design document for the whole of Zen. And that would cover every single chapter except Endgame, because Endgame we always intended to basically be a one-to-one -one copy of the original, because it's a sort of an outro scene, if you like. And through that period, I think about six months, I spent writing all of the chapters so Zen, Gonark, Interloper, Nyland. And obviously some of those chapters have got some very complicated storyline stuff and things that were either not very well explained in the original, out of context because areas that were intended to be in were not finished in the original. And that does come across in the original that a lot of it was, it was unfinished when they put it out the door rather than it wasn't rushed as such. It was, these levels are ready to go out, these levels aren't, so we'll cut the ones which aren't and we'll finish the ones that are. And some of it works and some of it doesn't work. Zen in the original is a three minute level. That's, I mean, it's not even a chapter as far as I mean. It's literally, you jump down some, some floating rocks, you go in, you chase some butterflies around, you open some stuff up and then you jump through a portal and, and you're already in a different area. We knew there was an opportunity for authorship in the Zen world because like with the Black Mesa stuff, with the Earthbound sections, we had created, we had invented, we had made a lot of things, but that game, that, that part of the game is by no means like our, it's an imitation, you know, uh, it's, there's innovation in there, but it's an imitation of, of the original Half-Life or, you know, it's, it's trying to be a copy of the original Half-Life and Zen is very much so trying to be its own thing, you know, and I think it was really interesting for the team to kind of you know go through these like growing pains or at least kind of like pay our dues making the earthbound section and then the that's kind of like the proving ground and the next opportunity is to like put all all that we learned and developed we were all very young and you know inexperienced uh, when we started up on black mesa and so just that day by day development and learning process we felt like when we were ready to take on zen we were ready to take on zen as like a different team as like a different company you know we were we weren't just trying to recreate what came before us we were trying to actually like make something that would be held in higher regard and, uh, and that was really exciting zen was obviously a troubled chunk of the game it was obviously uh, we we knew that it was uh you know universally reviled seems like an extremely strong way of like <laughs> placing it but you know compared to like the the experience of half-life you know zen is uh, just kind of leaden and uh, weighs it down towards the end there. I, I never really felt that way. I became aware of these thoughts by reading, you know, just other people's thoughts on those things. Like I could see that Zen was not as strong or as engaging as Half-Life, but I still just enjoyed the the whole experience, just the weirdness of it all. That The sensation of going into the unknown by yourself, like going, yeah, going into the unknown alone and all that kind of stuff is just that. I, I like that. 
So I was really excited to kind of reproduce and replicate those kind of things. I was actually uh, surprised to find out that so much of it was going to be scrapped or like thrown out when the original uh, Zen design document came our way. Initially, we had a really big problem with sort of the chicken and the egg of like, we didn't have art for these levels, so it was hard to make the design. And we didn't have design for the levels, so it was hard to make the art. That was the really compelling problems to solve. Uh, like, how are we going to do all this on Zen? Uh, like, again, Zen is an episode. It's a chapter. It's like we have to, we, we don't have a, a bucket of tricks that we can keep pulling things out of. We've got to redo everything. We've got to reteach all of our buttons, our switches, our elevators, platforms, centuries, breakable materials, uh, like the difference between gravity, fall damage. That was certainly one of the major challenges with sending the player to Zen was that you spend the entirety of, you know, I don't know, a five to ten hour campaign building up these design norms and then you take it all away. So what we had to do was we had to try and make sure that the stuff that you do in Zen feels like it still fits in with the kinds of things you encountered in Earth, but has a unique alien spin on it without being too different that players don't understand what they're doing, which is kind of, again, how the plug puzzles came into being, because they're very intuitive, whatever else they may be. You know immediately, got to plug things in. And you're still able to tie that into sufficiently alien systems, while also like having the design language for doors and for power and for things like that. So to put it most simply, it basically comes down to, at least with Half-Life style design specifically, it comes down to putting things directly in front of the player whenever they need to see something. And it sounds simple, and it's something that you probably that most players would probably take for granted, but it's actually really hard, especially if you're building a complex level. You basically have to make sure that the player's objective and the way the space is built always frames what they want to do. The player needs to see what they're doing when they press this button. The player needs to see their exit when they come into this room. The player needs to see what's next when they do this step of the puzzle, and it was something we really, really worked hard at, and I think it's kind of one of the unsung heroes of the way that Zen was developed. One of the things that we noticed really early on in development, and one of the things we were really scared of, was players getting lost and frustrated. In Half-Life style design, but actually doubly so for Zen specifically, you don't have objective markers, you don't have really an NPC telling you what to do, you can't prompt the player in simple ways, it's all done via the environment. And so that means you really have to double down on designing the environment smartly. The key way that we did that was just by framing things, by moving placements around by adjusting the angle that players come in at by adjusting the lighting around so there's there's kind of a combination of art and level design that goes into that i was really picky about when artists made changes to sections i would say no nope, you need to you need to move this back a bit because it's obstructing the player's view of this thing slightly in the opening room of interloper the way the vats flow the the tubes all flow towards the exit and the in Interloper, every single exit is signposted with a giant red energy core. And we always make sure the player is facing that energy core when they come into a room. And I think this is something that people never noticed consciously when they were playing it, but it somehow somehow just guided them towards the solution without them realizing it. Yeah, that was a real great challenge with Zen, was that all of these tools that we had in Earth and we used liberally the same way that Valve did, they're all gone and then you have to kind of reteach it to players and again that was that was one of the things that i think was very effective about chris's original structure was that when you enter zen you get a chance to get acquainted with the natural environment first you kind of have that familiarity of the human polytunnel section as just kind of a way of not making it too much too fast and then you get into the alien tech towards the end of the chapter and then you really dig into it in interloper and it's all sort of consistent and cohesive but it was a real challenge because you end up with a very stripped back tool set compared to what you could play with on Earthbound and I think the same was true of the actual whole sandbox that we had to work with throughout Zen because I would say that half the fun of the Earthbound levels comes from fighting the soldiers they're a really interesting and dynamic part of the game they're really memorable and there's a lot of fun set pieces that come from their interactions with the aliens and things you do with them and then they're gone and we further made this problem hard for ourselves by then deciding that we weren't going to use the Vorts, the Agrants, or the controllers until Interloper. So you end up having a really stripped back tool set with which you have to try and create something cohesive and fun. And that was kind of something that was encompassed in all parts of the game, I think, not just architecture and level design and guidance. It was also to do with the enemy encounters and stuff like that. One of the things that really struck me about the original Zen 
was it felt like they'd got all these ideas that they wanted to do and their original ideas were a comprehensive, if you like, run through various different environments, which later was confirmed by access again to, to seeing original versions of those Half-Life maps uh, concepts from Valve for areas such as the swamps. Because in, in the original, there are no swamps, but there were concepts and there were beta maps for swamps and various other things. One of the things that I think that we did very strongly in Zen that didn't land in the original whatsoever, or wasn't even really attempted in the original, was a sense of progression and cohesion throughout the environments, throughout the chapter. And again, this mostly stemmed from Chris's plans, actually, and the, the kind of way that we ran with those and developed on top of them. But one of the things that we identified that we thought was a problem, and it, it was we, we think it was a side effect of how quickly Valve had to finish Half-Life 1 Zen, was that every map basically ends with you teleporting to the next map. And what that does is it creates a very... Comp it's, it's, it is disjointed because I think what ended up happening is Valve just linked maps together almost at random just to try and build a finished product. But it ends up being that you don't have a sense of progression, you don't track your journey, you don't really understand where you're going. So one of the things we tried to do was we really tried to make players aware that they're progressing through Zen and drive home these differences while keeping things familiar and cohesive. We kind of came up with the idea of, well, firstly, there's the biome progression. So, of course, you have the kind of more natural environments in the original, in the first Zen chapter, followed by the basalt columns and the weird sort of giant causeway crystal stuff that we explored in Gonar, and then the really strange organic stuff that there is in Interloper. We kind of came up with the idea of changing the color scheme as you progress closer to the tower, which, again, I think is something that players might have subconsciously noticed but never actually realized was something that we did. So we, we came up with the idea of having very tranquil colors in Zen. So you have the purple and the green, kind of familiar, naturey, relaxed colors that feel safe. Then in Gonark, it gets orangey and yellow as you're closer to the tower. And then in the interloper, it's red, which is obviously the universal color for danger. We even came up with a sort of nonsense rationalization for it, which was supposed to be that the massive portal at the top of the interloper tower was serving as a local sun which is why the environment gets a bit progressively more red as you head towards it. But the reality was we wanted to create a sense of progression, a uh, feeling that you're moving through the environment, that you're getting closer to danger, closer to the culmination. We also got the artists to, we created very soft, simple shapes in Zen. Then the artists went for more angular shapes in, in Gonark with the, you know, the crystals and the, the basalt columns. And then in Interloper, it goes absolutely crazy where there's all kinds of spiky, spiky rocks protruding everywhere. So it just, again, it kind of gets this layered progression throughout it that kind of ties in with everything else. The gameplay structure, Zen is very much focused on the wildlife. Gonark is kind of, you know, a little bit more cinematic, a little bit more amped up. And then Interloper is very heavily focused on the combat and the puzzles ramped up to the extreme. So we just kind of built all of these different progressions into the chapter, uh, into the whole of Zen, really. And then, of course, you have the Interloper Tower itself as the mechanism for your long term goal, as I mentioned earlier. So I really, I, I felt like that was something that we did quite well with us in, and I'm, I'm quite proud of the way that worked. We tried to think about short-term and long-term goals because a map is only fun and directed if you know what your long-term goal is and what your short-term goal is. So that kind of tied back into what I was saying where we tried to make sure that when you enter a room, the player sees the exit because that's, that's an immediate establishment of your long-term goal. And that was something that I think we did most effectively in the first Zen map, for example. You come out of that space, the interloper tower is right there in front of you. You know you're going there at some point. And then you also have the big island that you go to at the end of the map next to that. So you kind of get a sense that's where I'm heading. And then you kind of snake off the path to the left and you just get your short-term goals as you progress. Establishing immediately the short-term goal and the long-term goal and then repeatedly seeding new short-term goals using that same kind of micro approach as they progress through those spaces. The sort of the mantra for Zen was to have good Valve style design philosophies and then um, also sort of mirror Half-Life 2 in places that we could. And that's sort of where the Interloper Tower came out of, where you have this beacon, you have this endpoint, and it's sort of your reference. And as you progress through the levels, you get closer and closer to it. It makes the world feel more grounded, but it also gives the, the player a sense of progress so that they can physically see they're getting closer to their objective. And then, just building the levels so that we introduce mechanics in a way that the player understands them naturally uh, versus, like I said before, with with having the uh, like a tutorialized thing with like text or uh, or a cutaway or something like that. 
the problem with Zen is that we don't have these NPCs who are there to articulate concepts and point to things and direct the player. That was a big hurdle to get over, right? Especially when you're doing like a uh, an unbroken first person story where you don't have an opportunity to grab a camera and like you know throw it over like here's your objective look over here on the other side of the level and then the camera you know comes back and rests in your skull again and so i knew that there needed to be more story without npcs what we have to think about with zen is we have like three different kinds of players coming to zen right off the bat the first kind is the person who has played black mesa two to five years ago previously to playing Zen. And so we have an obligation there to kind of uh, bridge that gap and front load all the information in your objectives, kind of refamiliarize yourself with who you are, what you're doing, what, what's going on here, right? The second kind of player is the person who is just jumping into Zen right away, right? Like I'm sure there's people who played episode one or episode two before they played Half-Life 2. There's people who played Half-Life 2 before they played Half-Life. You know, so we had to also be mindful of, of that player, the person who is, you know, jumping into this, uh, this experience without, ha without playing Black Mesa previously. Maybe they're just interested in, uh, in Zen. The border world in Half-Life 1 comprised of four maps, Zen, Gonarch's Lair, Interloper, and Nihilanth. Crowbar Collective would retain this structure, but unlike the Earthbound levels, here they'd make an abundance of changes and add hours of extra gameplay on top of Valve's original piecemeal design. We're going to tackle each of these chapter by chapter, so let's start with Gordon's first steps on the border world, the first of the four chapters, appropriately titled Zen. For this, not only did the team create a more naturalistic and varied playground for the player to learn the mechanics of this world, but they pulled back on combat in favor of connecting this place to the goings-on back at Black Mesa. So we have to be mindful of the people who are returning to this after, you know, two to five years. There is the playthrough players, people who have literally just jumped through the portal in Lambda Core and have arrived in Zen. And then there are the, the third kind of player, that's the, the unicorn, like the, the person who's just jumping into play Zen and that's just what they want to do. We have to be mindful of all three of those experiences in a way that's going to allow that information to all be there at the front of Zen, no matter who you are, no matter when you're playing it. And that's when the things like the cold open came into play. That was an idea I had where it, it felt kind of cheap, felt kind of dirty, like trying to do like a cinematic or something like that within Half-Life. We were talking about the rules of Half-Life, but we knew that like what would be even cheaper or even dirtier would have been like previously on Black Mesa or something like that. You know, we, we did not want to, to do anything like that. We came up with the idea of, yeah, of this cold open. We wanted to set this thing up that would, uh, just refresh everyone with the, the information that they needed, right? We needed to point out that there is, a, there is an antagonist. There is, you know, a great and powerful being holding open a portal in some strange world over there. And like, we needed to make sure that if the player doesn't hear that dialogue from Lambda Core, that they don't know like what's going on over there, we still need that player to understand what's going on when they arrive in Zen to just deliver the, the stakes and the objectives of the story to the player directly so that when you wake up on Zen, you have an idea of what you're supposed to be doing, no matter if you, like we said, no matter if you played five years ago or if you just jumped through the portal. I'd say Zen was probably the biggest expansion on uh, what the original was. And the main thing I really wanted to put in there was a better tie to Earth, which we did through the polytunnels, which would directly link it to both the Lambda Core uh, laboratories, the question of ethics laboratories, and to a smaller extent, the anomalous material laboratories. In the way that um, the expansions for Half-Life had tried to put across, they would have had technology on Zen in little camps. So I created the idea that the scientists would have had different teams, uh, different setup, but they'd have had a base camp. With introducing more of the um, scientists into it, we, we thought there needed to be a bit more of um, a footprint uh, in the Zen levels, especially if you look at questionable ethics. They've been capturing these these um, aliens. They've been doing experiments on them in 
it, it's kind of hard to do that without some sort of forward operating base. And so it, it started as, a, oh, wouldn't it be cool if there was like a base there? I think it gives more storytelling that you kind of stumble into because um, if I remember correctly, they, they don't ever say, oh, we got a huge base since then. It, it's just something you sort of discover, which I think is fun. Originally, there were no polytunnels. It was a cave with some crates and various different things. What we wanted to do was to really expand on the idea that they were established, that uh, they've got all these facilities in Lambda Core uh, for teleporting you there, but they needed the opportunity, if they were going to bring samples back, they needed the location that they can create as a base. Uh, but because it's inside caverns, we figured that they wouldn't be able to just randomly teleport in there because how do you know where the cavern is? So I started concepting various different technologies that would be portable. And that's why the labs in earthbound areas look similar, but they're different, is because a lot of the technology in the polytunnel labs in Zen uh, are portable. And the story we're trying to get across is that really, even with all this technology, all the money and backing, they've only managed to make it as far as the swamps with that particular base. The Lambda Core labs don't really have a laboratory there because their investigations are purely on Xenian technology. Uh, and it would be very difficult to move one of the Zen teleporters, the sort of strange arch shaped things with the little bubble at the end. That wouldn't work because they're positional based. That's the way they work is different. Uh, teleporter technology to the way the ones they've got on Earth work exactly. Um, human technology, as is explained in Half-Life 2, is based on a different model from Xenian technology and is based on a different model from Combine technology. So Combine technology uses a dark matter uh, format of uh, teleporter, which only allows you to basically create a hole between dimensions. Xenian technology allows you to effectively go between dimensions, but anywhere on those dimensions. And human technology, they found a way to use Zen as a slingshot, and they can then do localized technology. And obviously, Aperture Science, which is not part of anything there, uh, created technology to get you through shower curtains without getting wet, basically, which I thought was fantastic. The, the idea that they came up with a technology for something as mundane as that, but actually it's a lot better than any of the technology that Black Mesa or uh, the Combine even came up with. And that's why the Combine are interested in finding the uh, Borealis in the Half-Life series. It's, it's basically to get hold of this portal technology that you can basically fire a portal at the moon and just travel there instantaneously. Most of the area there is designed for the anomalous materials uh, research in the polytunnels because that's primarily the kind of samples that they would take back temporarily to store. So the sample that you slot into the AMS would have been studied in another format. They would have had those those orange crystals. And then the, I forget, I think it's 8338 is the sample number, was given to one of the scientists by the G-Man and somehow it's corrupt. So it creates a major portal storm that is what triggers the whole series of games off. I did note on one of the whiteboards in the polytunnel that there are in fact other sites that you don't get to visit in the game, which kind of reflect the idea that was put across in the uh, the expansions by Gearbox, where there are other locations, other portals that are focal points. It was kind of trying to create this expansive feel to Zen uh, without actually making the maps for it. The important thing that I wanted to put into that structure of Zen was that the very first area that you get into would be an, a training spot for your long jump. When you first get the long jump, you can bounce around a chamber uh, with a portal whilst you're waiting for him to warm it up. That doesn't really give you much of an opportunity to see how it works. I wanted to create almost like an obstacle course to start off with not really combat or anything like that. So the original first area was basically a long jump training area uh, with some exposition, uh, some environmental storytelling. So we added bridges, we added various different things into that for the player to do. We've got a, a very easy chasm jump where you can jump across it. If you fail, you don't die, you don't fall into the void, you fall into it and you can walk back up and, start and try again because it's never a good idea to punish people for the first time they try something. That then carried over to, well, why would those bridges have been put there? 
what if they were trying to get to a scientist camp? And then Craig Murphy, one of the other level designers, he basically took this idea and he just said, why not make them uh, polytunnels? That was probably the level of Zen that saw the most polish and development over time, because we knew we had to nail the opening to, to hook players in and to get them to want to experience what we designed. It actually changed a lot over the course of its development, and it was kind of the test bed for the, the art that we used throughout all of Zen. So it was, it was, that's one of the reasons it was worked on a lot. So originally, some of the early versions had controller and vault fights in them, for example. As we kind of played more and more with it, it just didn't quite feel right. So we knew that what we wanted to do with this was something that Valve didn't do well in the original version of Zen, where you need to basically shock the player with fantastic visuals, this whole new world that they have to come and understand, and then you also have to ease them into the mechanics and understanding of this new world so that they kind of get used to it. So that was kind of why we ended up going with a relatively slow paced level. And that was an intentional design choice after we'd experimented with having combat and felt that it just didn't really fit whatsoever. It was a huge discussion of do we keep the old style controls? Um, we did a, a ton of tests with, we had uh, different test levels with what's the, the proper range for the long jump. And do we want to have it where it does the like uh, more Doom 2016 style double jump or like the Team Fortress double jump where you, you go more vertical? Keeping it in, in terms of Half-Life 1, we decided to go with more of like the, the rocket strapped to your back where it, it pushes you more horizontal. Uh, and then once we, we nailed the distance, we said, all right, we can't change this distance because that means we got to change every level that we've, we've built for this length. And the thing I really like about the long jump is it I think it it perfectly exemplifies like how we embraced the the valve design mechanics because we introduce it in the uh, the Zen cave where it's a really safe jump if you fall you fall into water you don't take any damage and then you can go up and you can try it again and then there's the second jump which is uh, also safe but there is a small gap but it's really hard to mess up and it actually drops you into the healing pool and teaches you oh this blue water heals you the next one is dangerous, where there's there's a, a really large gap, and you have to, to use the, the long jump properly to progress. And then the final one in, in uh, Zen A is you uh, pull a lever on a pulley system, it pulls a floating island closer to you, you hop up into that, and you don't have those indicators anymore. Uh, you just have to sort of guess and hope that you can make this super long jump uh, over onto this next rock. And, and hopefully by that point, we've given the, the player enough reps that they can use the long jump effectively going forward because it's really important in the Zen levels. For a while, we just kind of naturally went right into like right from Zen or right from Lambda Core right to Zen. And it was just like the same enemies and the kind of like same squadrons and the same kind of like fighting and the combat was getting just like increasingly like grueling and dull and was not providing anything like special or interesting. So in Zen, we would have Vortigaunts and things like that in Zen. And then it quickly became apparent that like, okay, we, we have a lot of stuff planned for the Vortigaunts, which we'll, we'll get into later, right? Like we need to sell this idea of them being passive. And in order to create this moment where the player will actually pay attention enough to the Vortigaunt to see that their behavior is different, I don't think we can have six or seven levels prior where the player is fighting Vortigaunts, just killing them on sight every step of the way, right? So our plan is going to be, we're going to drop the Vortigaunts out of focus for a long time. And then when they come back in and you see that their behavior is different, you're immediately going to recognize that there's something off, that there's something different with them. But so what we had to do then is we have to we have to figure out a way now to fill up Zen A. And so we 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 moved out all the controllers, all the A grunts, all the Vortigaunts, and that's where the conversations and discussions about new uh, Zenian NPCs and monsters came to be. That's where we that's where I had the idea for the uh, the H E Z, the the hazardous environment zombie. That's where we had the ideas for the underwater barnacles for the the alpha hound eyes, the uh, suicide hound eyes. Enemies that have variations on a theme will still be like recognizable. Player will still understand how to react and uh, respond when these things show up. Think about combat and think about combat spaces differently. When you're in the earthbound levels, you have the HECU and you have the, the female assassins and you have vortigons and bull squids and all, you have the whole gamut of bad guys. Uh, and when you get to Zen, you lose more than half of those. We needed more variety in our combat anyway, uh, and that, I, that was just a cool way to do it. 
What would happen if an HEV scientist was attacked by a head crab um, without their helmet on or something? The armor is, is pretty much impenetrable. You can't kill them by shooting them in the body. Uh, so you have to aim for the head. So it's a harder skill test for the player because you actually have to aim and, and have those accurate shots to take them out. You know, you'd be hearing this monster coming around, you know, with like a minor, major fracture, detected, de 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 detected, you know, like those kind of things, a blood loss, detected. <laughs> If I remember correctly, Kevin Sisk, who's the, the voice actor for the Garden G-Man, he was like, oh, we, we have to have this actually be freaking out and bugging out, and like the team definitely agreed. We knew we needed to vary up the combat with our, our limited NPC set, so we, we started adding uh, variants of the enemies, uh, even simple ones too, like there's a class of the bull squid. Uh, that will only melee you, so he doesn't use his spit attack. And, and little things like that gave our designers some options to uh, set up different combat scenarios. Uh, but the main driver was just how our, our limited time and the fact that we were behind and we needed variations quick. There's a lot more to it, but for all intents and purposes, there's um, they're basically skin swaps. And then we gave them uh, different uh, attributes to, to try and vary up the gameplay um, and introduce new things to the player and also maybe hint at like um, how a species might evolve or, or different uh, versions of the of a similar species and the zen uh, alien life forms it took us a while to kind of nail down the exact gravity that we wanted to use and how the kind of parameters of the long jump and that kind of came about mostly from gonark actually um, where we found that we kind of were trying to refine how how the, the long jump felt when you were fighting gonark and kind of how the player can behave with it so that was when we came up, for example, with the idea of long jumping backwards and sideways being possible. I think one of the things that sort of was one of the huge problems with the original Zen is there's not really much to it. It's mostly just platforming. And I think the example you gave of the spinny platforms, that's actually the opening map of Half-Life 1 Zen. And it is really frustrating. You're just arbitrarily jumping between some platforms and hoping you have enough health to survive it. And it's just not fun at all. So we kind of knew that that was really frustrating and we weren't going to be doing that. Because at the same time, while we thought it wasn't very good, we also understood why Valve did it that way, because they wanted to teach the player the long jump, they wanted to teach the players the parameters of the long jump. It was just they hadn't really developed that very much. So we knew that when we did our version of that map, we were going to kind of take the spiritual idea of hopping between the islands and remake it, but follow an actual structure and kind of strip away any of the parts that made it frustrating and trial and error. So that was kind of the whole thing that we tried to do with our Zen, was we tried to spiritually capture a lot of what the original did but not actually mechanically capture any of it because there pretty much wasn't anything. The the butterflies thing you mentioned, that's the closest example I can think of of a new mechanic that Zen introduced, really, apart from the long jumping and the platforming. And again, because we were focused very heavily on trying to build this large experience with a cohesive gameplay progression, one-off mechanics just don't really feel very good, I think. And again, that kind of ties back to what I was saying earlier about where we may have overexpanded on some of the mechanics and seeped them into each other a bit too much as a kind of form of overcompensation for trying to deal with the fact that we cut out some cool one-off mechanics, if that makes any sense. And that was kind of why we ended up not really carrying over much of what was in Half-Life 1's Zen, because as far as I can think, we pretty much did everything that they did mechanically. We just expanded on them a lot, kind of drew them out over multiple maps, and then spiritually tried to capture a lot of what those sections represented, such as the kind of multi-tier boss fight of Gonark's Lair, island hopping in Zen A, the progression through the factory in Interloper, and then some of the platforming aspects of that as well. Everything on paper looked pretty manageable, and we are like, yeah, we can break um, this up into maybe three levels. Um, like Zen, for example, I think is five. It's five or six, and we thought we could do it in three. Um, and due to um, budgets and, and resource limits, we kept having to break these maps into to smaller and smaller chunks so that the game wouldn't absolutely die. But yeah, in, in the, the, the length, I don't think, if, if you told us back in 2015, like, yeah, you're going to have a, a four hours and experience or whatever it works out to, I think we would have laughed at you. There were sections that actually evolved into other things. There's a, a giant Zen hub tree. Uh, that originally was supposed to be what we call the puffball maze, where uh, there was these uh, 
plants that would put out a toxic gas, similar to the, the poison head crabs in Half-Life 2. So you would go near it, and it would release a cloud of toxins that poison you and bring your health down to one. And then the maze itself would be filled with head crabs. So these kind of ineffective head crabs that normally you wouldn't care about now become lethal threats when you're under the effects of this poison. You find three power pylons, you break them, and that deactivates a force field that lets you get out of the puffball maze. I really like the puffball maze as an example because it's kind of emblematic of some of the struggles that we had on Black Mesa and some maybe some of the areas where we may have misstepped potentially and things that we can learn moving forwards from that. We built out this map Zen B, which was the Zenian swamp level early in Zen, and it was originally supposed to be just one map. It was originally supposed to include the puffball maze, which was really just meant to be this small section of the map. It didn't really fit into the flow of the rest of the chapter, so we found that when players were encountering this section, they weren't really understanding that they needed to go and deactivate these force fields. We just found that it was really frustrating and people when we got external testers to play it, they were going down to one health and dying and just getting angry. That was when, in the previous parts of the Zen Swamp, one of our other level designers, Craig, he came up with the idea for the gate plant. At its core, it's just basically a door, and you just you shoot a little cyst and it opens a door. We kind of came up with some of what we thought were quite interesting ways to use these, and then we kind of thought, okay, well, you've got this gameplay element that we introduce and we build up through the chapter. We need to give it some kind of ending. So we kind of thought, well, the puffball seems like a good place to come up with an ending for this bit of design. It was a really unique and interesting gameplay space, but the, this kind of was emblematic of the problem that we had as we were developing Zen, was that these things were kind of coming together in isolation almost. And while we were thinking about the, the total sum of the parts, because as I mentioned, you know, it was supposed to be the culmination of a mechanic introduced in the previous map, typically the way Valve layer mechanics and they layer gameplay is they introduce something in a really simple form. They then have a second step where it's then the more complicated form of the same puzzle. So in, our, in the example of Zen, we then do the same thing, but the cyst this time is around a corner and you have to follow the route to find it. And that's kind of, you're then learning the mechanic and showing you understand it. And then Valve normally change it up for the third time they introduce it. The puffball maze itself is supposed to be that third step. You've learned the mechanic, you've mastered it, and now we're making sure that you really know what you're doing. And we, we kind of twist it by introducing other layers to it it kind of got away from us a little bit. We then realized a bit later in development, this map is massive and it's taking a relatively simple mechanic a bit too far now. I stripped it down a bit, I, I massively simplified the space and it ended up becoming the space that you see in the actual version of Zen that we shipped now. I, I guess the conclusion was just that we just ended up trying to build on these mechanics that we'd come up with, make them fit into the overall structure but I think we took it a little bit too far. I think that kind of contributed to some of the overall criticisms that people would have of Zen, where it was maybe a little bit too long in places. Some of the gameplay mechanics, I think people thought they were a bit too simple to warrant how much we'd done with them. And it was mostly because we had to come up with these ideas and then try and make them fit into an overall structure. And as we did so, we ballooned those ideas out a bit much. And so it ended up being a series of inflated balloons, one after the other, that on their own were quite fun to play and worked quite well. It just ended up being um, perhaps a bit too much in places. We actually tried some versions of the game in Zen and in Gonark where there were different paths and it would give you a slightly different experience if you went back and replayed it. And it just sort of fought our, our core mechanics of having a linear game. Showing our inexperience when we, we built the mod, we wanted, we let all, you open all the doors um, inside of the facility and the goal was to, to ground the facility and make it feel like a real space but it ended up just confusing people because they could go back into these areas that they had nothing there was no objective in there uh, but they could still go into there and they would get lost and confused but we tried to vary it up with examples like the tree hub where it's point a to b like you start the level or drop into the level at point a and you can see where you have to go and now you're going to adventure around this hub and sort of um, reusing space uh, traversing the same space at uh, different altitudes or uh, going underneath things. Uh, that's very Half-Life uh, to us. The original... Sorry. The original Gonark Slayer was a bit of an oddity. While Half-Life had large beasts that you had to defeat, this was the game's first bona fide boss fight, and it happened almost at the end of the game. 
The original fight followed common boss fight conventions in that it all took place over three stages. In attempting to fix this, the team at Crowbar Collective decided to broaden these three stages into much larger levels. A cat and mouse chase that takes place over the course of multiple arenas and culminates in a final climactic battle. Chris had these really well laid plans. We actually pared them down because we were running out of time. We didn't want to have to art, you know, six levels. And we were able to compress that chapter into three, what I think really well laid out maps. We sort of switch who's in control throughout the map. So it starts off and you're in a battle arena and it's more of a standard boss fight. You have a bunch of rockets. Then you, you fight it out there. The Gonark runs away and you're uh, chasing. And then in map B, we try and flip it so that first she's kind of like pot shotting at you. And then eventually out on the ledge, she's like chasing you full out. And then you get to the crystal cave and she's like smashing through crystals. And you're like, oh, I really have to go now. And then it's still even more of a chase set piece in the C map, the final map of Gonark. And then you have your final knockdown drag out battles. It was really challenging to have that script flip that design sort of fights itself, but I'm really happy with how that turned out. We were very aware of the, the rose-colored glasses we were sort of up against, but we really wanted to do our own take on it, especially like once we got into the trenches with it. So with Gonark specifically, probably a, a, a bit of what the friction you were having and others were having was that role reversal, where do I just shoot rockets at her now and then that's what's gonna win, or do I just run away? I think the, the Gonark fight in Half-Life 1 was, was not super well regarded, so we, we wanted to go in and, and try and, and make it something that was our own, and, and we're really happy with some of the set pieces and the, the way the stuff comes together. We think overall the, the fight gives her a, a bit more of a place in the overall story. In terms of scale, we, we definitely wanted it bigger so that the player could long jump around. We use the, the long jump a lot more as a defensive dodge mechanic than uh, than I think the original Half-Life. The original game, it's, it's basically just three arena fights. You fight them in, you fight the Gonark in Arena 1, you fight them in Arena 2, you fight them in Arena 3. And for me, it's a weird experience because Gordon Freeman is really the, like, a, the aggro antagonist of that scene. Like, landing in this creature's territory, attacking it, and like chasing it down and just like killing it. and. Well, I feel like in terms of the narrative of like who Gordon is and what other kind of experiences you've had, I mean, it just to me it never. I don't know. Just going after Gonark just seems like very aggressive and like out of character. The idea was always to combine the original Gonark and then also to borrow heavily from the Episode Two uh, Antlion Guardian chase, right? And now that's an interesting one because the Episode Two Antlion Guardian chase is that monster is chasing after the player. The player has a very specific goal. They know where they're, they know why they're here. They know what they're there to get. You know, they're trying to get the antlion extract to save uh, Alex Vance. So you've got a very clear objective, very clear stakes. There's pressure, there's like a ticking time bomb. You know, you don't want to take too long. It all makes sense, right? And we didn't have any of those elements in the original Gonark encounter. And so it just felt like this very linear unengaging kind of it just did, it never like popped you know nothing ever like the version of gone arc that we were building in no way reflected what we what we all had in our minds it just it just like wasn't there when we would play test it so my idea was that we needed to create uh my the way that i approached this was like we needed to create then an antagonistic relationship with the monster if we wanted the player to feel like they need to chase down and kill this creature we, like, we want to spend some time here building an antagonistic relationship between the player and the Gonark. What we try to do is we try to introduce a strong, obvious objective, like right up front, which is like the tower, right? And that's how we eventually came up with, you know, having to you know, touch the crystals to power up the teleporter in order to get to the tower. And then Gonark appears and, uh, you know, destroys your uh, teleportation. You've kind of accidentally, incidentally provoked the creature's rage. Once we've got the creature defeated, we want you to start moving forward again towards that obvious objective. Like you're still moving towards what you need to be doing. And now, after a while, maybe it feels like something is out there watching you, paying attention, you know, kind of watching you from far. Maybe you see something, you know, skittering by some 
stalactites on the side or something like that, right? We want this feeling that you're being watched and then suddenly Gonark ambushes you. And it's a targeted attack. It's a personal attack. The monster is like after you now as a result of you, you know, attacking and hurting it in the previous encounter. You understand now that the creature is like a threat and should probably be disposed of. That gets you to then chase after the creature. But then the, the twist there is that the creature is only pulling you further and further into its lair, into its kind of like feeding grounds, you know, in your uh, excitement to chase down this creature and destroy it. Then you figure out, oh, wait, you know, it's got me just where it wants me. And now you're playing the, uh, the third level where it is just chasing after you the entire time. It's like right on, right on your heels, trying to kill you. You're still trying to get out. And uh, we wanted to build that experience up from... Uh, we wanted it all to culminate in a feeling that was like a knife fight in the closet. You know, we wanted you to just be like, like at the end of this battle, you know, just you and this huge monster just out of breath, like you've got no resources, just like trying to destroy this thing while it's also just been beat to shit and it's like trying to kill you. Go knock in itself. It's sentient in its own way. Getting a character across in effectively what appears non-sentient it's basically a giant crab with a testicle, so it's not really anything you can associate or get a character, but I wanted to have an antagonistic relationship between the player and the Gonark. A cat and mouse game, as such. Originally you were going to chase it, and then it would chase you, and then you'd chase it, and then it would chase you. We would have this section where you'd run into the onto the ledge the first time you saw it, and you get to the ledge, and now you have the opportunity to view the arena that you're about to fight in, to build up a kind of anticipation that something's going to happen there. So when you're fighting something as tough as basically a, a boss fight, you rarely have the chance to look around your environment, which is why there's now a teleporter puzzle. One, because it's an environmental way of telling the story. This is a portal device set up by the Vortigants. So then they need to power the, the teleporter on which gives you the opportunity to force the player to view the entire arena to find spots that they might, you know, use in the future. Oh, look, there's a healing pool. That's handy. And there's all these pods which have appeared. This is the non-verbal way that I set the level up to basically say, this feels too easy. There's a teleporter. It goes straight to the end of the game. There's all this ammunition and stuff and health. I'm, this is great. Something's going to happen. There's going to be a big fight here, isn't there? And you go through this whole thing and you hear occasionally the ground shakes and you hear a, a r sort of rumbling sound. Now we've got two different areas of environmental storytelling which needs to be done, which is you want to show that humans had made it to this location, but they couldn't get past this location. So it's kind of... The, the Gonarch there is basically the extent that humans have managed to get to. And there was only one team that actually went there. Originally, when the teleporter was used, it sent people to various random places. Um, those devices that you see with the spinny uh, lights around it are kind of focus points for those teleporters. They're not local teleporters, they're dimensional anchors, if you like. Uh, because Zen is technically, it's a border world, it's not within our dimension, it's on a different plane of existence. And these anchor points allow different teams to travel from the Lambda Core labs to those locations. And this particular one, Gonark Slayer, is where the Questionable Ethics team went, because they are the primary ones for the fauna of Zen. The whole of that lab is focused on solving, well, how do we get past this huge up crab thing that we can't beat? None of our weapons affect it. We fired rocket launchers at it, we've done this, we've done that, nothing kills it. As you find out, as you play it, it's very difficult to actually kill. In normal gameplay, you have to use basically an entire army's worth of, of weapons to take it down. So, being scientists, you find a better way of doing it, which was, they found a poison that would work. The idea was that I would create an archaeology for the player, to dig up the remains, if you like, of that early team. And if you look in the polytunnels, you'll notice whiteboard with various different research teams listed on it. And one team has gone missing, and one team has been sent to find them at Site B. And Site B is Gonark Map B. That's the Questionable Ethics team. And if you match the names on the whiteboard, you'll find their nameplates and lockers in the Questionable Ethics laboratories. 
Uh, so that was that was my direct tie to the uh, CES chamber to the Gonark chapter through the cyanogen chloride tank, which you can carry from the polytunnels all the way to the end and use as a basically a way to kill the Gonark without actually firing any shots at it in its final lair, which is a it's it's my absolute dream to make a Deus Ex boss um, from the original Deus Ex. The whole gameplay idea of Deus Ex was you can basically fight the bosses any way you want, including not fighting them and not killing them. And yes, you can in fact get through the whole of the Gonark's lair chapter and not kill the Gonark at the end. You don't have to plug the cyanogen canister in, you can bypass it, leave it, and you get an achievement for doing either thing. And um, it's your own little Noam Chomsky as well. Yes, yeah, our own Noam Chomsky, which I'm sure is a, an achievement that nobody likes me for now. <laughs> now we move on to the third chapter, Interloper, the biggest challenge for the team yet, because this is the part of Black Mesa where the narrative connections between Half-Life 1 and Half-Life 2 begin. The storytelling wasn't much of a strong suit in Zen because of how disconnected the levels were, but this part of the game contains two important areas, the Vortigaunt slave village and the alien factory. In Half-Life 2, the role of the Vortigaunts had changed, and while some of them were non-violent in the original game's factory, their role within the broader universe of Half-Life ended up being more complex. The same could be said for the Interloper Tower and the portal technology we see in Half-Life 2. So to connect the two games, Black Mesa would have to do a lot of narrative legwork in this chapter. And to keep the pace of the game from dipping, they'd have to add much more varied combat encounters. Originally, the factory that you visit in Interloper you never get to see what it looks like on the outside. It's It could be a underground, it could be a flat factory, it could be a set of caves. It's, it's very difficult to tell what it is because again, because the visual side of Half-Life 1, it doesn't really show you that in the structure. The tower in Zen is actually not a building, it's a creature. It's a symbiotic creature that's creating a terraforming effect which is why the interloper chapters differ visually from the Zen chapters. Zen is effectively pure Zen. It's what Zen would look like without any interaction or interference from any kind of outside influence. But that was another theme that I wanted to get across in the overall plan of Zen, was that the Vorticants and the Nihilans are terraforming it to be a more, an area that they can, they can live in comfortably. In Chris's original plans, it was intended to be four maps, and each map is sort of a separate biome of sorts. And then the idea was supposed to be that the tower is obviously the alien grunt manufactory, uh, while also housing the Nihilanth underneath the island, uh, and then kind of powering and keeping him alive as a form of life support system. A lot of the concepts that Chris came up with for Zen were around symbiosis. And so the tower is supposed to be kind of a half organic, half mechanical creature that is alive by itself. And then you, so you have the outdoor sections which kind of represent the island that's been corrupted by the influence of the tower, the waste and respiratory systems, which are the first opening maps of Interloper, and then you get to the sort of digestive system, which is the conveyors moving things around, and you come up to the nervous system later on, which is sort of the, the top level of the tower. And so we kind of built it out that way originally, and we found, firstly, it didn't feel very climatic, mostly. It was a bit too exploration-based, especially because with Zen, we'd leaned quite heavily into the exploration area. So we kind of set about expanding on the ideas that we thought worked and could be built into a gameplay structure. And that was kind of how Interloper ended up getting a bit dragged out, a bit longer than perhaps we'd originally intended. And by the time we'd reached that point in development where we were expanding on these, we didn't have the resources or the time or the luxury of being able to have all this kind of variety that we wanted. So we ended up kind of going with what we thought worked building out what we thought worked, and that was kind of how Interloper ended up being the way it was. And these were all really interesting things to reflect on and think about when we heard what people had to say about it. So it was a really interesting learning experience for us to sort of 
teach us in the future how to focus on gameplay in the right ways, how to build something better going forwards, if that makes sense. So Interloper A1, what we call the Garg Chase, it started off in a bunch of different versions. I can't remember who had the original concept for it, but we knew we wanted more Gargantuas in the game because they're they're fairly underutilized. They're like a, a big bad enemy, and I, I think you only see them in power-up and surface tension. So we, we wanted them to have some sort of indigenous area in uh, Interloper. And originally we were going to do a chase sequence where, um, kind of like the Lion King, where there's this, like, this fleet of hound eyes and bull squids and they're all running away from you and you're like intermixed in in this chase with gargs behind you and from there it sort of um evolved into more of this you know, like scooby-doo every door you open the bad guys behind as you run down it, it just kind of gets more crazy and crazy and, and we wanted to to put more and more pressure on the player as the the chase evolved we're super aware of the highs and lows and we knew we couldn't go to two high points in a row and it was something we really tried to refine down, and it's even as simple as having, um, after the controller fight in Interloper A, you go down an elevator, and originally that was going to go into another combat section, what we called the, the mining area, and that ended up being cut, and it, it worked out well because it gives you that low now of now you can just sort of chilly walk through this valley, there's a couple of jumping sections, uh, you wind your way up some routes, and then it drops you into... The Gargantua chase. Yeah, if you if you do too many of the combat stuff, it burns the player out, and, and they they don't get any respite. Um, they can't take anything in because they're constantly under duress. And I, I think that's a big part of the Half Life series is being able to take into your surroundings, and it helps add to the grounding of even though you have these crazy fantastical sci-fi stories, the fact that you have a moment to breathe and like look around and, and see these structures and everything that was built um, helps it feel more real. What ended up happening was we, as I mentioned, we found a lot of the exploration just wasn't really that necessary at this point or that interesting because we'd already done a lot of it. So we ended up cutting out all of the exploration. We then found, well, it's not fun. It's not exciting. It's not interesting. It's no different from going to a chase and surface tension. It doesn't raise the stakes at all. So I started thinking about ways to make it a bit more interesting. The first solution was narratively driven, which didn't really help much. It was that instead of you just jumping across the gap and evading him, you jump across the gap, you turn around, and then he fights another Gargantua. And so they kind of have a bit of a territory fight and they both fall off the cliff. And it was supposed to be a fun little set piece to cap off your chase with that Gargantua. But of course, we then realized, well, this doesn't actually make the chase any more interesting. With another one of our level designers, Jordan, me and him kind of did a whole bunch of back and forth to try and build in these other mechanics into the chase, such as what ended up being in the chase where you, you kind of climb up little bits, you dodge through little obstacles, you duck underneath things, you break things. And so we ended up building a version of the chase which was one Gargantua and you kind of have a whole obstacle course as you're running away from him. At the same time, this was when Gonark was being worked on and developed. We found that these mechanics were quite fun and quite interesting and we pulled a lot of those mechanics into Gonark. And uh, so I worked on the final map of Gonark's layer as well. I kind of plagiarized my own ideas. I did a lot of the interesting stuff in the chase there where you have to like break webs, where you have to dodge left and right around things, where you have to long jump down gaps and stuff like that. Because I just we just felt it made Gonark more interesting and we kind of thought that was where we should focus the bulk of the interesting and unique ideas because there's a whole chapter structured around Gonark. But then of course you run into the problem of the Gargantua is effectively just Gonark. There isn't really much of a difference between them. They're just these two big monsters that chase you effectively. And around that point, we started thinking, well, maybe we should just get rid of it entirely. It doesn't really add anything unique and interesting. It's not that much fun. It's using elements that we've now ported back into Gonark that work well there. What can we bring to the table with it? We ended up just talking about, well, what the hell can we do to make this fun if the stampede doesn't work? And we then realized, well, we've got two guards at the end who are fighting each other. That's how we cap off the chase. Why don't we just have multiple guards throughout the chase? Rather than having one Garg chase you around multiple obstacles, we could have it so that you get away from one Garg and then you find there's another one. You get away from one and then there's another. You get away from him, but then there's two more. And then you get away from him and there's three more. And then you come back and meet the one that was chasing you earlier. And that was kind of how the Gargantua chase ended up being this entire crazy romp through an, a whole map where Joel built an amazing track for it. And then we thought right at the end, why don't you just turn around and you see there's eight Gargantuas standing there looking at you 
roaring and kind of being angry at you. And we thought that would be the really nice cap off to it. And so it kind of ended up being this really big set piece that we thought worked really well and helped pace the chapter out a bit more that still separated itself from Gone Art while using a lot of the mechanics that you'd learned in Gone Art. And so that kind of just got built into this this big thing as a sort of a way of trying to f to fill the pacing of the chapter overall, but also kind of fit in for some of the mechanics that we cut out and some of the ideas we hadn't explored that we felt did add to the game. Interloper, like I said, I, I think interactivity is a, a huge thing with the, the Half-Life series, even going back to Half-Life 1, and to feel like you're in the world and affecting the world. You're the, the reason that this whole disaster kicked off, so we wanted to continue that. You're changing the world, you're having an impact in the world, you're having an impact on the story, uh, because a lot of stories told these days, it, it feels like the main character is just along for the ride. You get told where to go, you get told what to do. Um, so we, we wanted the, the player to have some stake in it. In the earlier Zen levels, it's it's about engaging the player. And then as you get into the interloper levels, um, we wanted it to be like, you're going into this alien factory and just breaking everything. Like you're you're messing up all their stuff to, to, to make it feel like you're weaving through these machines and that like you're the alien now in someone else's world, like just breaking everything. Let me back up too. First, Ben wanted to introduce uh, the idea of the passive Vortigons, because it's actually in Half-Life 1, when you're in the factory, the Vortigons won't attack you. And I think most people, myself included, didn't pick up on that. So Ben and others wanted to introduce a story beat that we have, we show these Vortigons as slaves, as they're being taken over and forced into these labor camps, more or less. So we have this reveal of this large structure on a cliffside, so the player knows they have to eventually go over there. And they long jump over to it, and then there's this uh, short tunnel sequence where you can actually hear the Vortigons above you um, in distress and getting attacked more or less. And then we wind you around around to this uh, framed window where you can see an Agrunt beating up a Vortigon. The whole goal is to, to make you feel bad for these Vorts. And um, I think most people get it. They, they take out the Agrunts, but they, they try and leave the Vortigons alone. And then we reinforce it by after you go up the elevator, you push a button and there's this large reveal of the interior of the village. You're blocked, you, there's nothing you can do to progress. Uh, and there's a Vortigani kind of shakes his head at you and walks away and then another one comes up and, and pushes the button and lets you through. So they, they're they sort of helping you along your, your path and, and it makes you empathize a little bit more with the Vortigons. There is a Vortigon village in the original Half-Life. Uh, it's not a village though, it's kind of like there are these weird little caves that I think are like carved out of these walls that might have like like a light fixture or something like you know kind of you know something that looks like a candle or something hanging on a wall which makes it feel like it's a residence and I believe that's the only kind of like smattering of backstory or like context for like you know the Vortigons existing in Zen. I don't know what your experience was playing the first Half-Life but I did not understand that uh the Vortigons were pacifist uh my first couple of run-throughs, right? And that's, I think that's exactly what I was saying earlier, is that's because I've been kind of shooting them on sight in every level previously, and so that when I see one who doesn't immediately go to attack me, I don't, my brain doesn't, you know, take the, the few seconds necessary to, to actually process that this thing is not a threat. Um, so we wanted to take our time and really make a moment where the player is going to uh, be absorbing this story beat. Especially because I think thematically, Half-Life is so good in these kind of like story reversals, chapter by chapter, where a just one other little thing is revealed and suddenly that turns, you know, your expectations or your, your thoughts on, on what had been happening like on its head. And it just, Half-Life is so amazing because it does that so consistently. You know, every chapter reveals a bigger part of this mystery and you, the player, you're the single entity moving through the story who's kind of piecing it all together as you go. The big turn in Interloper is obviously the, uh, the, 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 the reveal of these, the Vortigons are not a inherently angry, evil species. You know, in fact, they are pitiable and kind of like pathetic and uh, being, you know, oppressed by something bigger and crueler. You know, they're being made to act against their will. So yeah, with all these kind of things in mind about like how important the Vortigons are in the story and 
how their role changes from Half-Life 1 to Half-Life 2. Uh, there's a very important connective tissue that we need to acknowledge uh, about how they go from enemies in Half-Life 1 to these kind of like downtrodden uh, fellow members of the Resistance in Half-Life 2. The Vortigon Village, it, it had multiple roles. And the first one, like I talked about, is just introducing them uh, as helping you along your, your journey um, and sort of teeing things up for Half-Life 2. You get to see a little bit of, of where they live and, and a little bit about their, their culture. If you look closely, you can actually see decals on the wall of like really crude drawings of uh, Gordon Freeman reading into like their, their ability to, to be telepaths. And then at the top in the control room, you're again blocked, and we show you the controllers taking over the Vortigons. So it's a, a set piece specifically designed to show that mechanic. You can see the lines going from their heads into the Vortigons, and then their, their eyes change color from just the, the regular texture to like a really glowing red, which you see through all of Earthbound. We wanted people to feel bad for them, and we wanted people to, to target the controllers that, that are controlling the Vortigons first, sort of create that, that priority target list to hopefully have more interesting combat. What, what I call the, uh, the Akira treatment is that we needed glowing red eyes that left light trails behind them when you encountered an enemy Vortigon. That would very quickly to me kind of, you know, a glowing, a glowing red eye usually means enemy in video game talk, right? So that would help make the Vortigons seem aggro and evil whenever you encountered them on Earth. So like the big first step was like, we have to retroactively change all of our Earth Vortigons into these new red-eyed glowing Vortigons, right? Uh, the second thing is looking at Vortigaunt lore in terms of what do they look like, right? Our Vortigaunt resistance members in Half-Life 2, they don't wear the green shackles. The, the, that very familiar thing about the Vortigaunts when you'd be going through like the, the Hammer editor and they were called the alien slaves, right? In, in the original game, and that's because they're wearing these like weird kind of like green glowing uh, shackles all over their bodies. To, to retroactively fit that into the game, we looked at the only instance of those shackles in Half-Life 2 which is when there is a Vortigaunt uh, push broom at the very beginning in point insertion, he's just, he's, he's a slave, right? He's like a slave to the Combine and he's still wearing his shackles. Obviously, those shackles are part of what makes them slaves, part of what controls them. Okay, what do you want to control about a Vortigaunt? Why, what is it about a Vortigaunt that you would need the shackles to control? Uh, they have their Vortigaunt, like Vortessence powers, which we see where they can, you know, kind of go in between realms uh, they can kind of teleport around. They've got the. Uh, they seem to have some kind of hive mind where they all like you know can communicate or something like that. And then they've got these electricity powers. They've got this natural electric power. And to me, that seems like if you're the slave master, if you're the controllers, to in order to make sure that your slaves do not you know instigate a rebellion or something like that, you're going to need to control their natural weapons, right? So those shackles must in some way act as like an off switch to their electric powers and also their kind of like, you know, psychic connection that, you know, uh, connects them to other forts. Now that we know what those look like, we also have to figure out what that uh, what that state change is going to look like, right? Like how are we going to represent a Vortigaunt going from a passive state to the aggro state. And that's how we, we came up, you know, like the, the controller flies down and, you know, uh, you know, shoots out these beams and then you see the Vortigaunts like reacting in fear. That was all very important in terms of like selling the idea that the Vortigaunts do not like the experience of being controlled. That was also very important there is like, uh, in order to kind of like make the player feel sympathy, right? Like in order to make them feel anything, it's it's very important to kind of see what the Vortigaunt thinks about the situation, you know? And if you see that creature in peril, hopefully that's tugging on your empathy, empathy bone a little, you know? Like hopefully that's like, it just does that kind of half-life turn. It allows you to see this character or this story from the other side all of a sudden. And that's like, those are those magic moments in half-life when suddenly, it's all different. Like the whole story has changed. Everything that, that that turn is again. It kind of echoes these turns that Half Life does continually the entire time. And the one that I gravitate towards this this kind of light bulb experience for me was. Um, and this is I did not realize this until years after playing the game. And uh, I might be completely wrong, but this is my interpretation of it. I believe that in the the scene we've got at the very beginning of We've Got Hostiles. 
which is the chapter where uh, you discover that a blood third, you know, that a military cleanup crew is coming to eliminate everyone associated with the project or the, the, the disaster, right? For God's sake, open the silo door! They're coming for us! It's our only way out! Oh my God, we're doomed! They're coming for us! It's our only way out! Oh my God, you know we're doomed. And yeah, like I said, I always thought that meant there's the aliens that are coming after these characters, right? That's like, he's trying to, like, they're coming for us. It's our only way out. Like, get us out of here. But then I realized that the silo door he's trying to open up is to Blast Pit. And when, at the end of the level, you are told to go into, through those silo doors, into Blast Pit. And that's to, like, worm your way through the facility to avoid this military cleanup crew. So... That scientist who's pounding on the wall, on that window, he's not saying they're coming for us, it's our only way out. It, like, he's not saying the aliens are coming for us, like we have to get up to the surface to safety. I believe he's saying, like the military is coming for us. We're, we are going to be killed by them. We have to get out of here. Oh my God, we're doomed. And then he runs off and he hits like a trip mine, right? Which I believe is the designer trying to compensate for this character not being able to turn around and give you a more you know, more information on the story to tell you, like, it's a bloodthirsty military cleanup crew. You know, like, I, I think that's very specific. I believe it's the same thing with the Vorts, where it's like, oh, these Vorts, they're evil, they're monsters, they're terrible, but then you actually get to see them and you understand that, oh, they are doing this against their will. This is not just the cut and dry story that you, that you believed it was, you know, that, that was being served to you. What I get the most gratification from is when the Vort stuff works, when people see it, when they recognize it immediately, like what's going on, and when they like feel bad for them and don't want to, you know, when they, when they then don't kill every single Vort they see <laughs> afterwards just because they can without consequence. It's like amazing that, that it works so effectively that, it, you know, it tugs on the empathy enough that people understand the creatures, understand the character's plight. I, I couldn't imagine a better... Uh, you know, just like a better scenario for that. That's what we wanted. So it, it, I think the the Zen levels for, for what I pulled away personally is um, how the narrative connects to the design. Like I said, we have the, the Interloper A set piece where we introduce the Vorts as sympathetic. I think that's a really important beat for that sets up the rest of the chapter. And a lot of people try not to harm the Vorts because of it, uh, which I think is, is interesting in, in, inside of a video game. And then just the, the really the reinforcement of how to build your mechanics and how to introduce things and not have the one-off mechanics that people walk into blind. That and how to properly scope, because everything on paper looks doable. You have to find ways to actually get things tangible so that you can scope it and, and have an idea of how long it's going to take so that you, you can get it done in a reasonable amount of time. It, it evolved a lot as, as we built it out and as we sort of started to see it in its whole. And then what we really wanted to do, and it's something that we didn't quite accomplish, I don't think, is we wanted to show the process of the agrants getting manufactured. So at the very start of, I believe it's Interloper C, you see an empty pod and it's not lit up, it's just a, a gray pod. And then it goes into a machine and then on the other side of that machine, it's now it's lit up in green. And originally we were gonna have uh, where you could see like green ooze like coming into a machine. And then if you shot a, um, a pod before it was baked, just a, a ragdoll a grunt would, would flop out of it. It would go and get baked. And then as it progressed, now you would shoot it and there would actually be live a grunts. And then there was a whole section where you're supposed to see their armor uh, getting attached. And, and pretty much we wanted to tell the story of how this army was made it's one of our regrets that we didn't, we weren't able to really nail that. But you can see elements of it throughout, where the the agrons are on the wall in uh, the control rooms in Interloper C1, and you can see the, like the early bits of that factory of how these pods are getting made. The room just before what we call the brain, it has those vertical blue columns, and then there's some scientists and I believe some HECU that are captured there, and that's a callback to Lambda Core, where the guy says until the team started being collected themselves. Before the survey members started being collected themselves, that is. So we wanted to show where these these people ended up, and also the sort of the flip side of questionable ethics, like what the the, the alien version of it. So we, it's a small hint to that, 
And the main goal of that, though, is just as rearmament, so that you get all all your uh, your gadgets back before starting the Nihilanth fight. And then there's a, a small, um, what we call suck events, uh, that, that pulls you through to the next room where there's just a, a giant uh, galaxy hologram, uh, and then you wind your way up onto uh, the, the teleporter. We were definitely mimicking the, the Citadel, and, and not only just as a callback, but like I said earlier, just so that that could be your, your waypoint, your guide point for the entire adventure. And we wanted it to, to pay off in the end where you actually get to, you first get to Zen and you see this tower miles in the distance and now you're actually on top of it. And we have some story points where you can hear like echoes of um, voices from the, the Earthbound chapters. As always with Half-Life, you're the one that decides to jump into the portal, you're uh, in control of your progression. One of the big takeaways I have from making this project is I, I'm also the one that has to like look at the budgets and stuff and sort of evaluate if we do this thing, is it going to make its money back? Is it going to be worth the time we spend on it? And what we saw a lot of people, because you have this long drawn out interloper fight and then you get to the, the top of the brain room and there's this, this smaller teleporter and people are like, this has to be it. This has to be the jump that takes me into the hill lamp to do the final boss. And it's a little bit of a fake out because it's a small jump that takes you just outside the tower to look at the, the super big red teleporter. And we saw a couple of people welling up there and, and sort of getting some sort of emotional impact there. And, and sort of my big takeaway was like, had I only looked at it in terms of funding and counting beans, like I don't think you get that payoff if, if you just look at it in a spreadsheet. I, I think that's where you have to trust your designers to of like, hey, you know, this is going to take time and effort, and it's going to be a struggle, and it's going to come down to the last minute, but this is going to be worth it, and this is what's going to give you that big payoff. Okay, we're almost at the finish line. With the bones of Zen complete, all that was left was the final climactic boss fight, the encounter with the huge floating baby itself, Nihilanth. Or Ninilanth, I'm still not quite sure how it's pronounced. The original game's boss fight was tricky. The only way to kill the floating bugger was with a trick shot you had to figure out. Meanwhile, he was capable of throwing portals at you that teleported you to levels that resembled Counter-Strike 1.6 jump maps filled with alien controllers. The end result was a boss fight that left you feeling with a sense of relief rather than accomplishment. But again, it wasn't exactly something the team could cut. This was the final boss of Half-Life after all, regardless of how people felt about it. Our mantra for building the Hill Lanth, Chris built out these uh, elaborate plans and we started with like sort of the, the simple stuff and, and built up to what it eventually ended up being. We knew we didn't want to take the player out of the room. We wanted to simplify it. We wanted to have a combat space that the player could understand and, and like stay in and fight. One of the things you don't, you try not to do in game design is if you introduce something to the player, you don't change it people aren't going to pick up on that. And, and one of the things they do there is now suddenly it's low gravity, which the rest of Zen, if I remember right, doesn't have low gravity. So that that feels weird uh, to have that sudden change. And then the teleports were frustrating because you'd have this slow moving thing. It would build up tension, but not in a good way where you're just like, no, 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 no. And then you get teleported to another room. Now you got to do first person platforming to get back to the fight where you really want to be. So. We tested bringing in other NPCs, like uh, Hound Eyes and stuff, uh, that didn't test very well. And what we ended up doing was uh, having the Nihil Lamp pull in parts of Earth, A, as a resupply, so that you could get some more resources throughout the fight, uh, and B, sort of as a nod to the previous teleport section of like, okay, he's not teleporting you places, but he's bringing these other things in, and then he ends up throwing like security jeeps and tanks at you and stuff. So like, a callback to Earth, a callback to Half-Life 1, the whole thing was built to be a spectacle. The real challenging boss fight, I think if we're being honest, is, is Gonark. 
and then we wanted this to just be like a, a, a crazy spectacle, challenging, but like we wanted the player to sort of uh, feel satisfied, not challenged. That was probably like the pinnacle of us working cohesively as a team. Everybody was frustrated in that it wasn't coming together, but we weren't frustrated at each other. We were we were trying to take bite off a little bit at a time, um, and it was always the idea of, oh, we're going to try this thing. It may not stay this way. We can always try other things later, but first let's do this, see how it goes. Then we'll try the more elaborate ideas. Then we'll try the more elaborate ideas, and then we'll remix it if we need to. Um, and it worked really well in delivering us to where we needed to be with that fight. I think actually the the crystal, the head opening up in the crystal was came in later in the boss because we we sort of realized that we had to do a, a nod to to how you actually defeated him in Half Life One. We built out again rule of threes. We had phase one where you break the shield charger. Phase two where he's he healing himself with orange crystals that come out of the ground. Uh, and then phase three, he just gets super mad and blows away all your cover. And then now you're hurting him. He can't reheal. He doesn't have a shield anymore. You damage him enough to it actually goes into a phase four where he's he's basically defeated, but he's more or less short circuiting. So like everything's going off at once, and that's why you have that crazy overbearing effects going on. His head opens up, and then he tilts it back so that you can get a shot on it and, and take out the crystal to uh, finish him off. In the original game, and obviously with, with the Lawmaster idea, the downside is we didn't have Mark Laidlaw on hand to ask every question. You don't really want to, to bug the person that wrote Half-Life um, every five minutes on Twitter or email. I've, I've sent him a few emails about various things that I really wanted. I can't remember if we responded now. That's a long time ago. But. So there was a lot of writing uh, involved with the Nihilanth, a lot of uh, thought into what is the Nihilanth, who is the Nihilanth, why is he there? It's probably the only place in the entire game we actually have combine technology on view, although it's very subtly placed. It's basically the life support chair that he's sitting on is combine technology. This is because it's not specifically explained, and I'd have to look it up now, so I, I won't do that, but it's in the back of my head. I remember reading a few in a few places that the Nihilanth was escaping the combine and that they were slaves to the Combine. So obviously the Combine, which is sort of this Kardashev, I think, level three species, they built Dyson Spheres. They're way beyond the technology of anything that Earth has even encountered, which is why it took them seven hours to you know, defeat the Earth forces. The Nihilanth is obviously a very powerful psychic creature, as you keep hearing him in your head as you go through the chapter. So that's part of the, the storytelling that we try and do. That's in the original as well. You go into chapters, you hear him speaking in your head. We start the Nihilanth fight right at the start of Zen. So right at the very start of Zen, as you portal in, you're traveling through a wormhole. Portal technology is directly tied to the Nihilanth. In the original, uh, game, there was a game mechanic where he would fire teleporter balls at you. Now, in, in the 90s, I am quite old, so I do remember all of the 90s games, like in Quake 1, they have a teleporter boss, basically. The way you, be you beat the end boss of Quake 1, Shabnagurath, is you wait for this little ball to fly through him, and then you telefrag him. And it was, a, it was a thing that you found in those 90s games that developers loved making puzzle boss fights. The idea that you have to solve a puzzle whilst you're fighting an end boss, which worked brilliantly back then because the pace was a bit slower, graphics were not potentially as, as impressive, there wasn't as much going on. The idea being that if you have these breaks in the combat with the teleportables, you can dodge them in the, in the original by standing behind columns, um, but if you get teleported, well, the boss fight stops. All of a sudden you're in a jumping puzzle. I remember from the original being massively disappointed. Oh, it's another Shabnigurath boss fight where you've got to do a jumping puzzle. Yes, it gives us an opportunity to pick some ammunition up, but it breaks the game flow because you've broken the, the fight, if you like. It's no longer a frenetic action scene. It's now a frenetic action scene followed by menial task, followed by frenetic action scene. And the idea was that in the original game, you had to blow up crystals that would heal it, otherwise the boss fight would just go on for ages and ages. 
So we've got that mechanic from the original in there. It's got shields as an added mechanic, simply to make it slightly more complicated, where you can take out panels of the shield and then shoot through those. Or you can disable the shields entirely, which makes the boss fight a lot easier. And that, again, brings in the idea that if you think about the fight as you're fighting it, it makes the fight easier. One person, one of our testers, worked out that if you were to drop three satchel charges at them, one each, you could detonate them at exactly the same time as the crystals come up, which just ent entered that phase instantly, and you were instantly into the final phase of the fight, and you could basically finish the thing in about two minutes. The teleporting side of it, I thought, in the Terminator films, when they portal in the time sphere, if you like, it sort of cuts a chunk out of it. So what would that chunk look like if you were on the other side of it? So basically those sections of facility are areas of, of the facility that the Nihilith has tried to rip out of reality and drop on your head in a sort of panicked, I'm, I'm just going to throw everything at you, which is why you get cars and rocks thrown at you. This is sort of, okay, I'll try something bigger. So he tries to rip up entire buildings to throw at you, which just so happened to have very handily placed ammunition and health. And you have to suspend disbelief on that one just a little bit, but, but basically that's, it's our way of re you know recouping your ammunition, providing the gameplay mechanic of the teleporting uh, from the original. And also, it, it, it kind of works with the flow of the fight rather than detaching the player from it. So I felt that if you had any gaps in the fight, it wouldn't be the same thing. You really need to have the fight as one big final moment. With the Nihilant, portal technology is really important because he basically creates a focal point for Zen in himself. He controls all of the creatures, he also controls, um, in the same way that the controllers have a psychic connection to the slaves, uh, the vorticants with the slave collars are basically connected to the controllers. Controllers are basically a lesser form of the Nihilanth, and he has control over the controllers who control the vorticants, and everything else is kind of connected to that. He sits not at the top of the uh, interloper tower, he sits below it in the roots of the tower, which you can see above him, um, you'll see these sort of curling roots, which are actually the, the base of the tower. And the Nihilanth is the brain. He's the overall thing. And he controls all the portal technology, all the, the areas. So his psychic prowess, if you like, transcends dimensional barriers. It's not a matter of, oh, he can make you teleport from A to B or from a room uh, he can basically create a portal the same way in Half-Life 2, they open a dark energy portal and you can start seeing Combine on their homeworld. And it's the idea that they're going to open that through. The, the Nihilanth can do the same thing, which is why you get all these creatures teleporting into Earth. They're not using a device, they're literally sent there by the Nihilanth. Because he feels you're invading his world and enough is enough. I don't know the full story of the G-Man because it's not Half-Life 3 isn't out yet. I have read Mark Laidlaw's Epistle 3. It kind of explains it in a way, but it it's very vague for obvious reasons. And I didn't feel that it would be a good idea if we kind of create a conclusion to the G-Man, the Nihilant, the Combine, anything like that. We left it as vague as possible. It's not our place to write the lore of Half-Life. That's Valve's. The Nihilanth isn't really a, a fighting boss. It's a, it's a kind of a boss that tells the end story, which then continues into the end game chapter, where you see the final explosion of the island. And the player, if they're sort of really engrossed in the story, suddenly realizes they've just killed possibly the last of its species. And just the power of the creature that you've killed is shown as he basically his psychic powers creator mini black hole which then implodes and the whole island explodes in this vast explosion that would easily have wiped you out if the g-man hadn't popped in and just gone actually no i think we're going to keep you on um, for the next game and uh, and then off you go and you go through this whole thing where the g-man is now controlling what you're seeing and you kind of get the feeling that you're not actually there in Endgame, and neither is the G-Man. What you're seeing is a projection, which is actually completely true. The G-Man is a projection from a technical perspective. He is in a 
box room that's got black texture everywhere and all the lighting is just switched and then the camera moves through each different part of the level and the tram that you see at the end is kind of that little vessel before he moves you into stasis or storage or whatever it is that he did i won't spoil the half-life alex game as to what it is that you get put into rather an anti-climax after what you've just survived the nihilance is very important from the perspective that you have basically removed a barrier from the combine the invasions you see on earth are caused by the nihilance not by the combine the combine fill the void that you create when you kill the nihilance and then they take over the world in seven minutes or seven hours or whatever it was, seven in a war. You you have quite an impact on wrecking the planet as a as a player. You you don't really win Black like Mesa, you kind of end the world by beating the Nihilans. You think you're winning, you're not. So I think we, we stayed pretty faithful to actually what G Man says. We wanted to have more spectacle, like if with the the island blowing up, and we wanted to do a, a callback to um, the the Citadel in Half Life Two, where time freezes and, and the G Man emerges out of a doorway. Um, and then, other than that, for for the rest of the lines of the delivery, we tried to find assets that we weren't really using, uh, like the black hole, for example, is in the background of one of the shots. That was originally going to be in Zen A as part of the the skybox, but it didn't quite fit in, so we decided to reuse it there. And then I think it was actually Nate that had the idea to break apart the tram, sort of for the, a, it, it comes together around you, and then if you do the bad ending, it like gets ripped apart, and then you go through a bad tor uh, portal and get the, the bad ending. So that was just sort of like everybody having their input and, and little parts adding up to more than, than it was. Zen is a remarkable achievement, the final act of a team that had earned its black belt in Valve and game design over the course of a decade-long refurbishment. Black Mesa Zen was a sprawling, richly designed, often beautiful single-player experience, which also did a lot of work to tie together much of the narrative baggage between the two original games. When the credits roll on Black Mesa, it features the names of hundreds of people who touched the project over the years, many of whom have gone on to have their own careers in games. But for the folks at Crowbar Collective, who shipped 1.0 and rebuilt Zen, what comes next? Because if there's one thing I'm sure of, being a fan of this series as long as I have, and someone who loved playing Black Mesa, we need more games like this. More games that follow the Valvian design principles. It was crazy that we released almost the, the, the same month as Alex. It really was the same month as Alex. So it was it was great to have that that just line up. And then for us going forward, we we really want to internalize all the things we've learned, uh, especially on the scope end, on, on being able to, to do this as a full production studio and not just a bunch of volunteers or part timers uh, who can contribute when they're available, but like actually making games uh, on a consistent basis with more regular schedules. And one of the unsung parts, I think, of the the whole project is just how we were able to communicate. Um, we're super fortunate that that COVID hitting and everything really didn't impact us because we're a remote studio to begin with. As hard as it's been to deal with with COVID and and just life in general, like we're really fortunate to that we were able to work within those constraints. Going forward, it's just improving our craft, and, and yeah, and we're going to be doing our own thing going forward. Valve threw us the keys to the kingdom and let us do whatever the heck we wanted to. It's a life, it's, it's incredible, you know what I mean? Like, the idea that they did this, I don't know if the the decision to let us make this game in the first place, to, to let us put it on Steam, to let us sell it, like, I don't know if these things were, like, the whole... Valve crew is assembled around a table and they're deliberating over whether or not they're going to let little Black Mesa, you know, do this stuff or if it's literally just like a hand wave, like, yeah, fuck it, you know, and like an email. I don't know what that decision was like, but they let us do it. And that's been the coolest thing 
ever. It's, it's, it's an opportunity to to just nerd out on my favorite piece of like pop culture ever, you know, to just like tear it open and dig into it and study every little thing, uh, you know, like it's just been an amazing experience. The team actually met with Valve in 2015. They went to do a, um, a meetup at Valve and did the Valve tour and stuff like that. To my knowledge, most of the Valve team said they hadn't played it, uh, but the ones that did play it said they'd liked it. And then we've also got uh, Dario Casali, one of the original level designers, said that he, in an interview somewhere, I think, that he would play Black Mesa instead of Half-Life to get reacquainted with the series when he was working on Half-Life Alex, which to us, Black Mesa level designers, is pretty much the ultimate honor because that man is a fantastic level designer. Um, and then, of course, Half-Life 1 is a masterpiece, a generational masterpiece of the game. So to hear that from someone that worked on it and had quite a meaningful role in it was absolutely incredible. What I think about, what I would want to do in the future is, I mean, listen, if an opportunity comes down the line to work on another Half-Life anything in any con, like, of course I would take that, uh, of course. Uh, my my concern for, for now is like what my interests are is I just want to make games that still, to me, encapsulate all the things that Half-Life does well. You know, I want to continue, like I've just been working on puzzles and stories and structure in the, the Half-Life genres, you know, I just, I feel like I really understand that stuff and I would love more opportunities to do that. So any any opportunity that would provide a game where you can mix story, puzzles, combat, and platforming, you know, in, in a fun and engaging way, like, I would be completely happy to do that. It's story, platforming, puzzles, and combat, and it's just like, that's, the, that's it, man. Those are the four quadrants. That's, like, all I need to, you know, feel warm and tingly, and uh, I love the process of, of, of hammering those things out. I love collaborating with this team. Like I've worked with this team for 15 years. We have a shorthand, you know what I mean? We understand each other. You know, we can talk to each other where we can immediately kind of pick up what we're, what we're trying to convey uh, in ways that would be easier talking to these people than it would be to talk to, to anybody else. What this, I, I think I can only really talk about it, what it means uh, like in my personal context. I don't want to like speak for what it, what it means for people in the industry because I don't know and I don't want to put us on like I don't want to say that we're more than we are because um, it started as a volunteer project and I think that spirit really carried through even while we were grinding on it to, to release it in retail. But for me, it's it's sort of the evolution of, of really understanding how to make games and, and the learning process never stops, but I'm starting to understand, I think, how we can tie all these elements together and make things even better in the future. For me, it, it started as I'm going to do this project as a portfolio piece and it's going to get me a job in the industry. And it did. And then I, I ended up getting laid off and then it became my career. So like it, it's been a really interesting, like up and down journey. Um, I, I think this this coming March will be 15 years on Black Mesa for me. So it's it's almost half my life of, of working on a product, uh, a project um, with with people who really care about that. Uh, project and 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 who wanted to see it through and and have it be enjoyable for for everybody that plays it. All right, let's see if I have many scientist uh, phrases I can remember. Okay. Why do we all have to wear these ridiculous ties? With my brains and your brawn, we'll make an excellent team. Hello, Gordon Freeman. It's good to see you. They're waiting for you, Gordon, in the test chamber. <laughs> you got any more? I'm trying to remember. Oh, man. Hello! I feel like there's ones like that. It's just weird little barks they do. Yeah, if you talk to them enough, they say, Can't you see I'm busy? Can't you see I'm busy? Yeah. Hello, Gordon. I feel like there's one of those. Bah! Oh, yeah, I should do all the sounds when they get hit. Bah! <laughs> bah! <laughs> bah! <laughs> bah! <laughs> bah! <laughs> Hello, Gordon. Why do we all have to wear these ridiculous ties? Just give some quick feedback. I think it's uh, the overhaul helped a lot. I 
just kind of want to see us start to simplify and really smooth out the, the rough parts. Uh, like these animations, for example, they, they, they take way too long. Um, they're trying to emulate the burning barrel. Um, I get that, but they, they still take too long. We need more games like this. More games that follow the Valvian design principles. Cool. All right. I think we're good. These moths are like swarming. It's wild, isn't I have it? No idea why they're over here. There's no light over here. Ah, look! It was hiding a white claw the whole fucking time. <laughs> Woo! Oh, uh, that shot looks so fucking good, dude. About that mirror I owed you. <laughs> I'm dressed as the wrong fucker. Oh boy! Look at that sky. Look at this shit. We have a really weird job.